how does somebody begin to know if the issues they're experiencing are coming from SIBO? So there's a number of ways to do it. One, you look for telltale signs that suggest you do indeed have 30 feet of uh, overproliferated unhealthy microbes. So one common sign would be fat mal- malabsorption. Look in the toilet, and if you see fat droplets, or you see the water uh, where the water meets the porcelain, you see some staining. That's evidence for fat malabsorption. If you have recurrent rashes that don't respond, that's a very good sign, especially eczema, but other skin rashes also. That's a good sign. A lot of skin rashes go go away, by the way, just with elimination of wheat and grains, as we did in the wheat belly experience. But the people who have persistent rashes, despite that, that's a real powerful sign of uh, SIBO and also of CIFO, by the way. Um, uh, wild swings in mood can be another sign. Failure to lose weight, even when you try, uh, do everything right. That's another sign. Another sign is insulin resistance. If you have a high blood sugar, uh, like 105, 110, or in millimoles, like six or seven, and yet you've done everything right, that, that can be a sign because endotoxemia, the high serum, L, uh, the LPS levels, causes insulin resistance. And then there are conditions that are virtually synonymous with SIBO, fibromyalgia. Probably 100% likely that you have SIBO and you got it really bad. Uh, people with irritable bowel syndrome. In the U.S. alone, that's 60 to 70 million people. So a lot of people. So there are more people with IBS in the States than there are humans in Canada, which is an amazing thing if you think about it. So the majority of those people have IBS. If you have an autoimmune or neurodegenerative disorder, you likely have SIBO. If you have any kind of intestinal condition, also colitis, Crohn's, celiac, uh, high likelihood you have you have SIBO. Now, uh, sometimes just having any of those conditions is sufficient to take action on it. But there's also a new device called the Air Device A I R E. I don't work for them. They're not. They don't pay me. <laughs> it's just a cool device. Came out in 2019. And just as finger stick glucoses that came out in the mid 1980s was a game changer for diabetes, it's it's hard to remember, Jesse, but back then, if you had diabetes, all you had was urine dipstick, which was a terrible, that's why people were having blindness and kidney failure at age 27, because they couldn't control their blood sugars because urine dipsticks were so crude. And what if you had a three-year-old playing in the backyard and she, a type one diabetic, and she passes out? Is her blood sugar 900? And she's going to go into diabetic ketoacidosis and shock in the next few minutes? Or is her blood sugar 40? And she's going to die of brain damage in the next three minutes. You can imagine. What do you dip the urine? <laughs> so finger stick blood glucoses were a game changer for the management of, of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. This is the equivalent for management of, uh, of intestinal health. It doesn't mean you must get it. It just means it's one of the great options you have. Another problem we have in U.S. and Canada, is the doctors have not kept abreast. So if you went to, you know, I would favor the Canadian system. I think the U.S. system stinks uh, because it's all bent on profit. But it, the, regardless, if you go to the doctor, either country, and you say, hey, doc, I think I have SIBO. The overwhelming majority of doctors will say, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, no, you don't. There's not. Uh, I didn't see anything in your colonoscopy. Or did you consult Dr. Google again? And so there's, unfortunately, they're a generation behind in this emerging and very robust science telling us, yeah, there's something very fundamentally wrong with the microbiome. What that means, it's like nutrition. You can't count on the doctor to tell you how to eat, right? They don't know, but that's not their business. Their business, they don't say this, but their business is the business of dispensing pharmaceuticals and procedures. And in the U.S. more so, for the benefit of healthcare and sires. It has nothing to do with health. In fact, I would say, this is going to be harsh, they practice willful ignorance. If I can make $4,000 a day putting in stents or just get paid a few hundred dollars covering my overhead to tell people how to eat properly and get their microbiome back in order, which one are you going to choose? Well, the, my colleagues all choose the procedures, the greater revenue return. And so if there's a new development in the microbiome, or nutrition, or the power of replacing lost nutrients, they tend not to even care. Willful ignorance. What what that all means is that you, me, your listeners, 
have to take it on themselves to do these kinds of things. Because the doctor is more often not, not just failure to help you, but may in fact be an obstructionist or impediment to your success. That's why I wrote the Undoctored book, because I saw that people really did have astounding power to take back their own health. And the same remains true here in the world of the gut microbiome. You have access to incredibly powerful tools. It doesn't have to be the air device, many other things, to restore a healthy microbiome and lose weight. Stop the progression of diabetes. Get your blood sugar down. Uh, reverse numerous health conditions, but you got to take the initiative yourself. It's an empowering way to look at it and the right way to look at it. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> I wrote on doctor because I realized that people were succeeding in spite of their doctors, not with the assistance or the benign guidance, but in spite of their doctors. And the same remains true here. Let's talk a bit more about conventional ways of handling SIBO. You talked about colonoscopy being what a conventional doc would use to diagnose it. Are there any other tests different doctors might use to see if SIBO is a concern? Well, first of all, of course, most won't even know what it is. They'll say, Jesse, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't waste my time. You're fine, right? Dr. Google, all that business. If they are better informed, there's a small minority who are better informed. Some of the gastroenterologists, for instance, are better informed. What they'll say, sadly, is this. Well, first of all, let's do an endoscopy and colonoscopy, right? Make sure it's not something serious. Oh, good news, Jesse. You don't have stomach ulcer, don't have stomach cancer, don't have colon cancer. Goodbye. And you say, well, what about my SIBO question? At the very most, the best informed will write you a prescription for rifaximin, which is the conventional antibiotic. It works about 40 to 60% of the time, but typically unaccompanied by any mention of how you got it, how you can prevent recurrences, and recurrences are the rule. So there's not a complete conversation. They just give you a prescription, goodbye. Uh, if, uh, but another choice for people is to not take a conventional antibiotic, but take an herbal antibiotic. Now, only two herbal antibiotic regimens have any kind of proof of effectiveness. There's one regimen called candibactin, another one called FC cidal with bisbiocide. Now, I was skeptical these things work because they're concocted in a haphazard way. But then there was a study that came out from Johns Hopkins that compared those two regimens to uh, rifaximin. And lo and behold, the two herbal antibiotic regimens uh, were superior to rifaximin. And the rifaximin failures, of which there are many, the herbal antibiotics were effective. So there was a time when we were using herbal antibiotics also with, with pretty good results. Uh, that is relief of the symptoms like diarrhea, bloating, irritable bowel syndrome symptoms, uh, rash going away, or normalizing breath hydrogen gas on the air device. Um, but more recently, we've been doing something different. Oh, I should mention another way that doctors can prove that you have a SIBO is to do H2 breath testing, but in a laboratory. It's clunky, it's expensive, costs several hundred dollars per episode, and often there's a need for several episodes. So this thing, and once again, I have no relationship with the company, except I know the inventor, Dr. Angus Short, and they're good people. It's about $200 US, and you get these discount codes, but you only buy it once. And you can use it over and over and over again, for you can see whether it's responded, you can assess for recurrences. One of the wacky things about SIBO is let's say your original symptoms were bloating, diarrhea, and depression. And then you eradicate it, you do a good job, and six months later you have a panic attack. That could be recurrent SIBO. The, the symptom profile can change because the bacterial species profile can also change and, and be associated with different symptoms. So the doctor does have access to a test that's very clunky, but is the equivalent of this. This is a far more modern, elegant way to do it. Unfortunately, most doctors don't even know about H2 breath testing. So it's, a, it's kind of a hassle to, to get it done. But one of the things that we've been doing is, so if, if, I, have, if I have SIBO, so 30 feet, unhealthy microbes turning over rapidly, dumping their, their breakdown products into the bloodstream. What if I take a commercial probiotic? Will it get rid of the SIBO? No. It might reduce bloating, might cut back on diarrhea a little bit, but it's not getting rid of the SIBO. And it shouldn't be a surprise because commercial probiotics are concocted in a very haphazard way. They're not created for SIBO specifically. In other words, they take one microbe, another, just throw them together, call it a commercial probiotic. So I asked a different set of questions. I asked, what if we chose microbes with characteristics 
that would make them more likely to have an effect on SIBO. Let's choose, for instance, microbes that colonize the upper GI tract where SIBO occurs. Let's choose microbes that produce what are called bactericins. These are natural antibiotics produced by some species, effective against the species of SIBO. So I chose three. I chose a strain of Lactobacillus gasseri. I chose my favorite microbe in the world, Lactobacillus reuteri, and uh, a strain of Bacillus coagulans. They colonize upper GI tract, produce bactericins. The gasseri in particular can produce as many as seven bactericins, so it's a bactericin powerhouse. Even the reuteri, many strains produce up to four bactericins. We co-ferment them as a yogurt, and I should mention it's not it's not the kind of yogurt you get in the store. You cannot buy these things as yogurt. We call it yogurt because it looks and smells like yogurt, but it's not yogurt. But we ferment it for an extended period because we want really big counts of bacteria. When you use extended fermentation, unlike commercial fermentation, you get hundreds of billions of counts. We, we examined our yogurts with something called flow cytometry, and we're getting around 250, 260 billion bacteria per half cup serving. So we co-ferment these three species. It makes a delicious yogurt, by the way. <laughs> and then you consume the yogurt, half a cup per day for four weeks. And so far, it's preliminary, Jesse, but so far, of the 30 or so people who've done this, 90% have normalized their breath hydrogen gas. So I think it's it's a valid and effective way of doing it. We will look at that more formally down the road in one of our clinical trials. Uh, but I But, you know, if I said you needed a frontal lobotomy to do this, or we're going to remove your colon, you better be damn certain you got, you need to have that done. We're talking about making yogurt. So it's such a benign thing. I think that the, the, the barrier to doing this is, is very low. Oh, this is definitely really exciting. And I'm curious when you're working with somebody with SIBO and you're having them make this yogurt, we're going to get into all the details because there's a lot here to break down, but are they still using the herbs that you mentioned before that product candy backed in? Is that part of the protocol or has this yogurt omitted that step? Yeah, so these are people, Jesse, who are accomplishing normalization, reversal of SIBO without any antibiotic, no prescription, no herbal antibiotic, just with the yogurt. You know, I've got a, a few microbiologist friends and one of the friends I was talking to, his name is Suresh. He runs one of the nation's largest probiotic manufacturers called Biosource. It's actually 35 minutes from my house, amazingly. <laughs> and he tells me that when they clean their vats, their fermentation vats, they'll sometimes use Lactobacillus reuteri. It's so effective in killing off pathogenic microbes, they actually use it to clean their vats. I, I corroborate this with another microbiologist. He said, oh, yeah. We use rotary to clean the vats. So that's how potent some of these microbes can be. So you can see, if you just slap dash together a bunch of microbes and call it a probiotic, well, no wonder they don't really do that much. They do have some benefit, but those much more carefully chosen. And maybe, maybe in time, we find even better microbes. Right now, this mix seems to be getting the job done in the majority of people. And to take this even more granular, you mentioned the three different species. There's also strains we got to look at too. I want you to break this down because a lot of probiotics on the market today, they will list off the different species that are in the product, but that's only half the equation. There's also the strain. So talk more about that. Excellent point, Jesse. Exactly right. So unfortunately, so strain really does matter. I, the, the best example I have is you've got E. coli, your li listeners have E. coli, I have E. coli in our, in our colons. Well, what if you ate lettuce contaminated by cow manure with E. coli? Well, you can die of that E. coli. You can go to kidney failure and sepsis. So same species, E. coli, different strain. So strain can actually make a life-death difference. Not always, but in some instances. So you got to pay attention to strain in many situations. Well, as you point out, a lot of commercial probiotics don't even tell you the strain. Or they assign a proprietary designation. They just made it up. A, B, C, one, two, three. You, you look up the science, well, you can't tell what it is. This is a big problem. It's causing a lot of confusion in the industry, and I don't know what the final answer will be. But in general, we want to pay attention to the to the strain. So one of my favorite strains, uh, bacteria, species and strains, is Lactobacillus reuteri. So that strain, that bacterial species has been lost by the great majority of Americans and Canadians. Probably 96% of us have lost reuteri, even though indigenous populations 
and other mammals, like your dog and the chipmunk outside your window and the squirrel. They all have rotary, but we've lost it because of antibiotics, herbicides, pesticides, etc. Well, when we replace it, the evidence is all about the strains called DSM-17938. So I'm so, sorry, I don't make these strain designations up. But when you replace that specific strain, wonderful things happen. One of the things it does is rotary colonize the, the GI tract and sends a signal through the vagus nerve to the brain to release oxytocin. So lots of people know that oxytocin is a hormone of love and empathy. So people will say, I like my family better. They don't irritate me as much. I like my coworkers better. They, they make me, they don't make me as angry as before. I introduce myself to strangers in line for coffee at Starbucks. I desire more connection with other humans. I understand other people's points of view better. That's the oxytocin. But then there's all these other, uh, non-emotional, non-social benefits, like a restoration of youthful muscle and strength. The ladies love it because it increases dermal collagen. And they start to lose their wrinkles. It also causes deep sleep. I'm a chronic insomniac, Jesse. I, I've always struggled to sleep. You know, four hours, five hours a night, watching TV from two till five, reading books. I now sleep straight through nine hours, <laughs> vivid, colorful dreams. It preserves bone density. It turns off appetite. Uh, in other words, a whole range. And when you think about it, preserves bone density, restoration, youthful muscle and strength. Uh, deeper sleep, smoother skin, age reversal? I think so. And, and you can see it in people's faces uh, when they when they uh, get this microbe restored. Uh, and Jesse, that's one microbe. That's the power of just one microbe. Well, let's take this even further. This is where I wanted to go next. You talked about rotary and how us over here in the West have generally lost that microbe. How different is our terrain in our gut versus, say, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, our hunter gatherers, do we have any idea of how much that's changed over the years? You know, the best evidence comes from the examination of the microbiomes of indigenous populations, whether it's not so much the Canadian In Inuit because they've been changed right by Westernization now, but some isolated populations like the Malawi in Eastern Africa or the Maasai in Kenya or the um, uh, Hadza in Tanzania, or the Yanomami in the Brazilian rainforest, or the Matsas in the highlands of Peru. These have all had their microbiomes characterized, and they have completely different microbiomes. They have species we don't have. We have species they don't have. They have far more species, much greater diversity, they say. Uh, now, here's the kicker. Here's the weird thing. These are populations separated by vast distances, even different continents, yet all their microbiomes resemble each other very closely. So that's presumed to mean that this is the Stone Age microbiome that we had 100,000 years ago, but we have changed. Now, it doesn't mean all those changes are necessarily bad. Maybe some of our changes are adaptations to modern life, but it does open the question, should we restore our microbiome to what they have? But it would require, I'm surprised that's not been done commercially yet, that is to essentially package what they have, in those ancient microbiomes, and have you take it as a, as a, pre, as a probiotic. It's not been done yet. Uh, I think we'll work toward that direction, but uh, the differences are so stark that it's, it's, it'd be a long journey to do that. But it does open some very, very interesting speculation. Well, on a personal level, would you say that is our end goal, what we should be aiming for, or somebody who's, you know, looked at the research and is so involved in this. I'm curious on, on your thoughts. You know, I don't know because, you know, if you're a member of the Hadza tribe and you're in the savannah of uh, Tanzania, you'll be doing things that modern people don't want to do. You'll kill an animal and in the field, you'll tear open its abdomen and you'll eat its intestine, maybe its stomach and pieces of the liver raw. Well, in other words, that's the best probiotic there is, right? <laughs> so, but I don't think I'm going to do that. You're likely not going to do that. So there are many practices that they engage in, meaning they've, they have a microbiome that's fashioned, that's molded by their lifestyles that we probably don't want to do. And then we have also, maybe there's some changes in the modern world that are adaptive and not so bad. One of the crazy things, very interesting obs observation is we have an abundance of bifidobacteria. In fact, in children, that is by far the most dominant 
species, collection of species in their GI tracts. They have virtually none. So does that mean we should get rid of all the bifidobacteria? Probably not, because they've been also associated with some pretty spectacular benefits. So it's not quite clear. They have a, an abundance of Prevotella. Uh, we have far fewer. Should we mimic that behavior and get more? Nobody knows. So, so a lot of unanswered questions. But you can see how provocative these observations can be. Yeah, for sure. Well, I guess my question then, if we're even trying to get back to part of that, we'll take the Rotori example. How introducing one, you know, species in one strain, when our microbiome is so different than it would have been 100,000 years ago, how would that really move the needle? One of the keys is to try to work to identify and then re restore what are called keystone species. So if we've lost keystone species, I believe Rotori is one of them, gas or lactobacillus gas is another one, Acromancia mucinophila is another one. I I'm sorry about these names. Fecalobacterium prausnitzii is another one. These are microbes so important that their loss means you'll lose many other species. So I think of it like plankton in the ocean. So plankton, the teensy weensy creatures that fill the ocean, that's what filter feeding organisms like whales and jellyfish feed on. What happens, and this is happening by the way, sadly, when there's a marked reduction or disappearance of plankton? Well, the whales are gonna disappear. The jellyfish are going to disappear, or a lot of other species will disappear. Same thing here. When you lose keystone species because you took antibiotics or were exposed to all those other things, you don't lose just that keystone species. You lose many others. So a good start is to identify and replace, restore those keystone species. Unfortunately, not all keystone species have been identified, but the list is growing. And those are mostly the focus of some of the yogurt and fermentation projects we have. And so sometimes people say, oh, this is overwhelming, all this talk of so many species. Well, I tell people, think of restoration of lost microbes, like going to a restaurant. If you go to a nice fancy restaurant in Toronto and the waitress hands you a menu, do you freak out and say, I can't order all these appetizers, and main dishes and, and desserts? No, <laughs> you pick and choose the dishes you want, right? Same thing in the world of the microbiome. If you say, I want smoother skin, deeper sleep, and uh, greater strength, cultivate lactobacillus rotori. If you want a reduction in arthritis pain, cultivate lactobacillus gasseri. I'm sorry, bacillus coagulants. If you want to shrink your waist uh, uh, and not change your diet, ferment lactobacillus gasseri. If you want a healthier child, a newborn baby who's more likely to sleep through the night, take longer naps, have fewer, fewer uh, bowel movements, thereby fewer diaper changes, 50% reduction by the way, cuts it in half, and uh, less colic. And as an older child has less asthma, less irritable bowel syndrome, uh, less autoimmune diseases, and a higher IQ, restore bifidobacterium infantis. So you can approach it that way. Choose the microbe for the effect you want. And you can also co-ferment things. And by the way, it doesn't have to be yogurt. Yogurt dairy just happens to be a very forgiving fermentation medium. Uh, but you can ferment other things. Coconut milk, hummus is a very good fermentation vehicle. Uh, I make something called Saccharomyces boulardii cider on my kitchen counter. It's very easy. It's an effervescent soda. Uh, and the fermentation uh, reduces most of the sugar and it's delicious. And that's a tremendous probiotic. I should mention one of the reason why we do this extended fermentation is because we want really high bacterial counts, more than you can get in a probiotic. And so uh, the easiest way to illustrate is this kid's riddle. Remember when we were kids and uh, somebody asked you, Jesse, what would, which would you rather have, a million dollars or a penny that doubles every day for 30 days? Of course, most of us, I'll take the million dollars. Because a penny, right? Two cents, four cents, eight cents, nowhere. Not recognizing that it becomes five and a half million dollars after 30 days. But if you looked at the progression, the sequence of rise in money, the big rise doesn't occur till day 27 or 28. The same phenomenon of doubling occurs in microbes. Microbes, of course, don't have sexual reproduction. They have asexual reproduction. One microbe becomes two, etc., like the pennies. So, uh, uh, 
The real increase in microbial counts, like in Rotorite that doubles every three hours, occurs at hour 33 hour 34. We know in commercial yogurt making, they typically ferment for four hours. There's nothing in the yogurt. So they add things like gel and gum, xanthan gum, carrageenan to thicken it up. We don't have to do that. We're going to ferment for a long time, 12 doublings. And you may recall from the flow cytometry, we get 250, 260 bacteria, a billion bacteria per half cup serving. So that's why we follow this extended fermentation. We go as long as we can. At some point, you don't get any more doubling, you get death. So we did do flow cytometry on yogurts made at 48 hours, and you don't get any further increase after 36 hours, probably from competition for the existing nutrients. So we talked about how it's a little more complex than just knowing the species. You need to get the strain right as well. So for somebody who wants to take this on and start to make, you know, the SIBO yogurt at home, where do they go about getting the proper species and strains? So because it's so tedious to tell you that uh, the strain you want for smoother skin is uh, lactobacillus rotary DSM-17938 or the ATCC PT-6475, or if you want relief from knee pain from arthritis, uh, you need to get the bacillus coagulans GBI-36086. It's, it's tedious as hell, I can tell you this way. So it's all in the super gut book. I laid out for you what, stra- what species, what strains, and where to get them. We can't get all strains, so I have an advantage. I get strains from manufacturers. And here, I'll tell you a dirty little secret. So I originally went on the Lactobacillus rotary bandwagon uh, using the strains from Sweden, the BioGaia gastrus, G-A-S-T-R-U-S strains. That's that DSM-17938 strain. Because the MIT group that did a lot of elegant work with that microbe showed us that strain does all these things. Acceleration of healing, restoration, youthful muscle, all all those effects, the social effects. So we started, I started with that microbe, made yogurt, because the tablets are sold to you in tablets for infants. So the microbial counts are so low. That was my original motivation for making the yogurt, to get these billions and billions of counts. Well, since then, I've got my hands on seven additional strains of Rotary. And now this is just my anecdotal uh, experience. So far, every single one has done the same thing. In fact, I think I have a strand that's even more powerful uh, but I can't share it with you because I got it from a manufacturer. They give it to me in bulk and it's not meant for dispensing or for, for sale. It will make it to the market eventually. I'll make sure of that in some form. Um, but uh, I think many strains of Rotary do this and may even do it better than the original strain. But that's that's still to come. Well, like you mentioned, people have got to get the book to get all the details. It's very nuanced. But for somebody who does get the book and they find out exactly what they're looking for, somebody who isn't in your position and can, you know, connect with the manufacturer, are they able to order these on like Amazon and have it delivered to their door? How complex is it? Yeah. So I typically talk about, I I told you the secret, but uh, ordinarily I just tell people about the microbes they can get their hands on. So for instance, that one that they get for their children is um, uh, Bifidobacteria infantis EVC001. That's the strain designation. And you can buy it as the Avivo product, E-V-I-V-O. And the people at University of California, Davis, did a lot of work. That's the one that cuts bowel movements in half, cuts diaper changes in half, deeper sleep, and healthier children with higher IQs later in life. So that is a commercial product. You might have to, it's like $79. It's not cheap. But the magic here is if you make yogurt out of it, you never have to buy it again because you can make the next batch from a little bit of the prior batch. And by the way, that product is sold and they tell you mom should give it to the baby mixed in breast milk. Because what what this microbe does, Bifidobacter infantis, is 90% of babies don't have it because they got antibiotics at birth to reduce beta streptococcal infection. Mom got antibiotics because she had an episiotomy. Uh, Or mom never had it because she lost it because she took antibiotics and other things in her her past. So the majority of babies don't have this microbe. Well, you need this microbe to digest the so-called human milk oligosaccharides in breast milk. In other words, it's a curiosity of nature. Breast milk has something very important for that child's development called human milk oligosaccharides. Well, without Infantis, it gives the baby diarrhea and it can't digest. 
the human milk oligosaccharides. If you restore Infantis, it dominates the child's microbiome. 90% of all microbes will be bifidobacter infantis. And now the baby can digest. So it, requ it requires the assistance of this species to digest these human milk oligosaccharides of breast milk. Now, so the company says mix it with breast milk, feed it to the baby. I'll say, go one step better. No, 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 no. How about mom gets it while she's pregnant or even before pregnancy? She makes yogurt or other fermented food out of it. She eats it. She populates her birth canal, breast tissue, breast milk, saliva, skin. She populates with Infantis. She passes it on to the baby like it's supposed to happen as with passage of the birth canal, breastfeeding. And mom can still give it to the baby directly too after birth, but why not do it the right way? And that way mom also gives the baby by Fitterbacter and Fantas in the context of her overall microbiome. So when you're making the yogurt, the microbes are gonna be feeding on the sugar in the milk. If we're using milk, you talked about other options as well. Are you putting any other food in while you ferment to you know, give them another supply so they can proliferate quicker? Okay, good, po good point, Jesse. Yeah, I, I learned long ago that uh, if you add a little bit of something the microbes like to eat, most microbes like uh, prebiotic fiber. So a common one is raw, unmodified potato starch. It's inexpensive. It's easy. A tablespoon per quart or per liter of whatever you're fermenting. Like I'll use organic half and half. That's my favorite. Good. By the way, we, we reject this idea of using low fat, non-fat. That's nonsense. Of all the problematic components of dairy, fat is the healthiest. And ironically, that's the stuff everybody avoids. And milk fat is wonderful. There are problems. There's the whey protein that has an insulin effect. There's the casein beta A1 in North America that has uh, immune effects. There's lactose. There are issues. But uh, ironically, it's the fat that's the most benign. Component. So we use I use organic half and half, which is about 18% fat. But I add a tablespoon of some prebiotic fiber. Could be inulin, could be... Uh, raw potato starch, and you get a thicker, uh, tastier what, uh, end product. One thing I've not done is compare microbial counts with and without the prebiotic fiber. I suspect, though, that the counts are higher with the prebiotic fiber. I'm, I'm always surprised that commercial yogurt makers uh, don't use a prebiotic fiber because the end product is so much more satisfying. And what about once, you know, you build up your gut microbiome over time, and you're trying to maintain that rather than build that up, are you using that same prebiotic fiber, say in some water or a smoothie on a regular basis to provide additional food for your new microbiome? Yes, absolutely. So uh, you want to, so you're feeding the microbes in your yogurt with these prebiotic fiber, but you also want to feed them in your GI tract with these, uh, with these uh, prebiotic fibers. So, and these come from things like um, uh, alliums, like onions and garlic and shallots, legumes provide the galacto oligosaccharide prebiotic fiber, black beans, white beans, kidney beans, um, chickpeas, hummus. Uh, the polysaccharides and mushrooms are very good. Uh, because we're trying to mimic the behavior of primitive people, we sometimes have to resort to some unusual things like a raw white potato, which you know most people don't eat, but you're mimicking the behavior of somebody who lives off the land and digs in the dirt for roots and tubers. Well, I'm not going to do that. Jesse's not going to do that. Your listeners aren't going to do that. Their ground's frozen uh, a lot of the year. You got things to do. <laughs> so we, we mimic that behavior by getting things we have access to, a raw white potato, a green unripe banana, or other sources. For convenience, you can get inulin powder, inulin slash FOS, a powder. Uh, you can get pectin is another good one. So the, the skin of apples, the rind of use zest for your citrus fruits that's full of, uh, of pectin. Uh, I try to make it a, a habit, and I, I suggest everyone do this, of getting a fermented food and a pre source of prebiotic fibers and related compounds at every meal. Because if you do that, you get these big effects. When you feed bacteria, the good guys start to win. You cultivate very important keystone species like Acromancia or Fecalobacterium. And those are the keystone guys that cause other species to proliferate. So now, if somebody's intolerant 
to either a prebiotic fiber. People say, oh, I can't use that inulin. It gives me diarrhea, gas, and anxiety, panic attacks. <laughs> or I take a probiotic and I get mind fog and diarrhea. Those are signs of SIBO. And by the way, also, Jesse, it's important for your listeners to know, if people say things like, oh, no, I can't eat nightshades, like eggplant or tomatoes. I can't eat FODMAPs. I can't eat anything with fructose like fruit. I can't eat legumes. Oh, no. I get bloating gas. There. That, the, the problem is not the food. The problem is you have SIBO. And you will register positive should you confirm with an air device. You'll get a high level on your on your on your air device so that the problem is not the FODMAPs or the nightshade the problem is your microbiome so I hear a lot of people say this so I avoid tomatoes and and eggplant and I feel okay well the problem with that is if you have SIBO that's unaddressed you're gonna have other problems down the road and it could be serious stuff it could be a neurodegenerative disorder like Parkinson's disease or Lou Gehrig's disease or dementia or an autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's thyroiditis or lupus. Or it could be an intestinal disease like ulcerative colitis or diverticular disease or colon cancer. So it's not a good idea to say, oh, I, I avoid those foods, I'm fine. No, you're not fine. You feel better, but you haven't addressed the cause of the food intolerance. But what I'm guessing you would say is early on in the game when somebody is you know, they haven't dealt with their SIBO yet, they should avoid those foods and probably avoid all prebiotic fiber, you know, overt sources, because they haven't cleared out the bad bacteria yet. They don't want to just put food in for those guys as well. I would assume they want to clear those guys out and then put the food in for the good guys. Exactly. That's right. So if you get explosive diarrhea, for instance, or panic attacks, every time you consume a prebiotic fiber or some other food you're intolerant to, exactly right. Remove that food, take all the steps, you know, remove all other disruptive factors. It could involve a high potency multi-species probiotic, fermented foods, etc. And then several days or weeks in, resume the prebiotic fibers. Because, you know, this, this is the mistake, by the way, a lot of people on a ketogenic diet or carnivorous diets make. They don't mind their intake of prebiotic fibers and related things that nourish microbes. What happens when you do that? Let's say you're ketogenic and all you're eating is, is fatty meats and green vegetables, etc., but no prebiotic fibers. Well, you're starving microbes, so their populations drop dramatically. Some species actually disappear, but there's one, there actually several species, but the primary one is Acromancia. Acromancia's full name is Acromancia mucinophila, mucus lover. And so other species die off or diminish. Acromancia can turn to human mucus for nutrition and starts to consume your mucus barrier. And that's a very bad thing because it causes intestinal inflammation, colitis, endotoxemia, bacterial breakdown products getting into the bloodstream, and leads long term to insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, uh, high triglycerides, um, uh, even diverticular disease and colon cancer. So you don't want to make the mistake of starving your microbes because acromancia is a good guy. It supports the mucus barrier. It's, it's keystone, unless you deprive it of the, those prebiotic fibers, and then it, it shows its other face and starts to eat you. And when it comes to somebody, say they're just on a low-carb diet, they're not totally omitting all the food for their microbiome, how do they know when they've reached an amount of prebiotic fiber that's going to feed the microbiome that's enough for them? Is it just subjective and you got to play with it? Or is it is there a certain rule of thumb or you recommend using supplements, the powder? Just curious on how you'd go about that for somebody who is, say, low carb. You know, it helps at first to be mindful of how much, how many prebiotic fiber grams there are in various foods. In other words, if you take a teaspoon of inulin for convenience, put it in your coffee, there's about four grams in there. If you have a raw white potato, uh, let's say half of a raw white potato that you chopped finely into your salad, you're getting something like 10 or 11 grams. So it helps be mindful. Maximal effect appears to occur at 20 grams per day. Now, all those indigenous populations we talked about, many of them get 
over 100 grams per day, but it's never been shown that that we should do that for benefit. But it may be the reason, by the way, they have an abundance of species like Prevotella because they have such a higher fiber intake, prebiotic fiber intake. But it's never been shown that if you or I or your listeners upped our prebiotic fiber intake to, let's say, 100 grams per day, that we gain some incremental benefit. I will tell you, anecdotally, I've had people say, you know, I just, just for laughs, I upped my prebiotic fiber intake to 100 grams per day and I got much, I felt much stronger and healthier and more energetic. Maybe. Have you ever tried it yourself? I have not, but I've gotten up to maybe 40, 50, 60, and I can't say I perceive an effect. Well, let's come back to the raw potato. This isn't something I've ever tried to include in my diet. You gave an example there, because I want more examples for myself and for the listeners, how we can go about incorporating that into food. So we can chop it up fine, put it in a salad. I'm assuming putting it into a smoothie would be another way to get that in without, you know, having to endure chewing a raw potato. Right. Yeah. You can just chop it coarsely. You do need a fairly strong blender and then toss it in, toss whatever else you want, maybe coconut milk and avocado, a couple of, a few berries, whatever you like. And yeah, it makes a very nice smoothie or, or shake. Uh, likewise, the green unripe banana, but it must be green and unripe. It can't be yellow. It can't be kind of green. It's got to be green uh, or else you get a big wallop of, of sugar if you, if it, if it's, uh, tending towards ripe. Uh, Adding inulin powders is an easy way. You can get galacto-oligosaccharide powders, but they're kind of pricey. You can get various mixes nowadays of, of a mixture of prebiotic fibers. I think they're kind of pricey. So I think the best way is just to get foods. Eat more asparagus, eat more legumes, uh, make it a habit of getting garlic and onions and uh, cloves, um, leeks, dandelion greens, there's lots of, you know, if you, if you, if you're mindful of what foods these, it means, and you keep your refrigerator and cupboard stocked with these things, it becomes easy to make sure it's an inclusion. You can include it in every meal. And I know the research is young and using your yogurt to treat SIBO is something, you know, you're just, you know, the big scheme of things just delving into and you want to do a lot more research, but what was the number you gave earlier? Was it 90% of people using your yogurt were able to treat and eliminate their SIBO? Yeah, of a small number, about 30 people. But they've, so not just symptom improvement, but normalization of hydrogen gas. And not, so I don't want people to get the impression you must buy one of these things to manage your symptoms. You don't have to. It does help. In other words, if you blow a positive value and then you do X, whether it's SIBO yogurt or candibactin ARBR or whatever you do, and then you test some weeks later and you're negative, oh, you know your the, the choice you made worked or it didn't work, or if you have a recurrence. So it is helpful to have, but you don't have to buy this thing. People can do this empirically. That is based on their best judgment. I have a lot of people do that also and still have spectacular results. And for people who do make a big dietary shift and start incorporating this yogurt on a regular basis, how common is recurrence? Is this something that most of us are going to face, you know, ebb and flow over the years? Yeah, recurrences are very common. Now, now, no one has the formula for preventing recurrence, but I'll tell you what I think works. I think the lactobacillus rotari works. You may recall, so the rotari is not just a source of oxytocin and smoother skin and deeper sleep and maybe love dreams, <laughs> but, it all, may, <laughs> but it also colonizes the upper GI tract and produces bacteriocins. So we're, we, we're, we're, we're thinking about, right, colonizing and protecting the small intestine. And so rotari, I think, has helped a bunch of people because we're not seeing very many recurrences in people who take the rotari, even though in other areas, other uh, uh, programs, et cetera, there's recurrences all the time. The lactobacillus gasseri may also be an important species to include to prevent recurrences. And of course, continuing all those other things. Don't get emulsifying agents in your foods. Avoid herbicide, pesticide residues, and choose organic foods. Filter your drinking water. Minimize the antibiotics. All those things still matter also, because if you go back to those things, it invites um, your SIBO back. Now, there are some people who, no matter what they do, continue to have recurrences. It helps to have some kind of formal assessment if you can find a functional medicine doc. What if you've, what if you were a wheat eater for the first 40 years of your life? And that triggered an autoimmune response 
against your stomach and you killed off the parietal cells that produce stomach acid and you no longer have stomach acid. Well, when you lose stomach acid, whether it's from an autoimmune gastritis or due to taking stomach acid blocking drugs, you've lost a great barrier to the ascent of stool microbes. So if you have lost stomach acid, you're going to have recurrent SIBO over and over and over. Mm -hmm. Really helps to have a doc who can assess that for you. Check something called serum gastrin. Because if your gastrin level, it's a hormone, it tells your stomach, make more acid, make more acid. And if your blood level is high, it means you don't have stomach acid. And then you have to talk about things like betaine hydrochloride, vinegars, carbonated drinks, things that acidify your food. There's no way to restore parietal cells, unfortunately. My point is this. If you have recurrent SIBO, no matter what you do, and maybe if you're still taking rotary or gastroid and still have recurrences, then it helps to have somebody go through a formal assessment to see if there's something wrong with your GI tract that won't respond to these basic natural efforts. That makes sense. And we started off talking about dysbiosis, SIBO, and CIFO being the three things that we're going to cover. And throughout a lot of our conversation, we've directed towards SIBO and, and making the SIBO yogurt and how you know profound the impact has been on, on a small number of people using that to treat SIBO. I'm curious, though, when it comes to somebody that has just dysbiosis, the bacteria haven't begun to, you know, ascend up the digestive tract, or somebody that has SIFO, fungus entering the picture, how different is the treatment protocol for those variations of something similar? For fungal overgrowth, let's say you've got recurrent eczema, you've got crazy mood swings, and you crave sugar. So you pretty common. Or you performed a stool analysis and they found a lot of uh, candida species in your stool. So thankfully, the fungal overgrowth is tough to deal with, but the agents tend to be very benign. So uh, we've been doing things like berberine or curcumin. By the way, there's a lot of these herbal preparations and Ayurvedic preparations and polyphenols, all kinds of stuff that for years we've known don't get absorbed. And so like curcumin, for instance, or turmeric, um, uh, if you take 100 milligrams orally, you poop out over 99 milligrams. <laughs> now, wait a minute. The evidence is quite clear. If you take curcumin, it reduces measures of inflammation like C-reactive protein. It reduces joint pain, like in knee arthritis. So it works. The several clinical trials, it works. But how? How does it get to your knee if you don't absorb much of it at all? Almost zero absorption. Well, so companies have been working furiously to force absorption. They, they add bioprin or piperine or black pepper or nanoparticle emulsions, all these manipulations, which have not been shown to be more efficacious, by the way. But I would argue, quit that. Don't do that. <laughs> Get the non-absorbed form so it stays in the GI tract because it's probably working. Curcumin is known to be an antifungal agent, moderately effective antifungal agent, has some antibacterial effects, and it has spectacular effects on rebuilding the intestinal barrier and mucus barrier. So we'll use things like berberine, curcumin, non-absorbable. And we also, I was skeptical about this also, but essential oils, food sourced essential oils, are very effective. Cinnamon and oregano are two uh, common ones, but there's a very specific way to do this. It, you can't take them directly because they're highly caustic. They burn. So there's a way to dilute it. And this has been very effective for us, but it can take you two months or longer to really cut back in the fungal numbers. But we're talking about relatively inexpensive and relatively benign tools. There's also something called methanogen overgrowth. I don't want to overload your listeners, but there's something called methanogen overgrowth. These are peculiar creatures with long names like methanobrevibacter smithii. These are microbes that evolutionarily predate bacteria. <laughs> They're also called extremophiles because you'll find them in the boiling water of geysers or at the bottom of the ocean at extreme pressures or in the Dead Sea with extreme salinity. And uh, scientists uh, speculate that if there's life on Mars or the moon, <laughs> it's going to be something like archaea because they're so hardy. Well, they also can populate your GI tract. But that science is not well sorted out. There's preliminary evidence that refaxman may work to do this. Maybe the candibactin regimen may. I don't, I cannot argue, I could not 
claim that our SIBO yogurt has any beneficial effect on overgrowth of those creatures. So we're still, now the newest version of this device now also measures methane. And you know what, Jesse, if you and I and your listeners, at least some of them, have a now a means to track methane, guess what's going to happen? We're going to find out ways to deal with it even before the science comes out. Because some will say, hey, you know, I took X and my methane levels normalized in two weeks. Somebody else, I'm going to try that too. Before you know it, we've got 30, 40, 50, 100 people who've done it and tells us that's not a trial, it's an anecdote, but it's at least a start. Yeah, very cool. And I know we got to part ways, but one thing I think it's important we touch on before we do is die off reactions. So people oh, yes. that are going to get in there and start mucking around and whether it be conventional antibiotics or some of the different natural ways we mentioned, including the SIBO yogurt, you get in there and you start killing these microbes and you're, you know, there's a good chance you're going to notice some negative response and negative feelings before you start to feel better. So talk about that a little bit and talk about the difference of die-off reactions from conventional ways of treating versus say using your yogurt. So this effect's been known for about a century ever since they first started treating syphilis of all things. And when that microbe of syphilis, treponema, dies, it releases its components and you get sicker, fever, chills, sometimes delirium, uh, you can't breathe. Well, thankfully the die off and we kill off microbes in the GI tract, like let's say E. coli and Proteus and Pseudomonas and Klebsiella are all 30 feet and we start to kill them off with whatever method we choose, an antibiotic or whatever. When they die, you'll get an, a, a burst of endotoxemia. It can feel like the flu, achy all over, low grade fever, uh, anxiety, panic attacks, suicidal thoughts, depression. There are ways to kind of subdue the effect. I mean, you can't not kill them. You're going to kill them. Uh, so ways to subdue it would be reduce the doses when you first start. So let's say you're going to kill off fungi with berberine and uh, let's say um, clove oil diluted into, let's say, olive oil. Go real low dose to start. So you don't get all that stuff and then build it up over time. That's one way we do it. Another way to do it is take something like activated charcoal and there's some other things that bind some of the LPS, some of the endotoxin. And it does, it does help like, um, like, uh, uh, 500 to a thousand milligrams of activated charcoal is, is quite effective. Uh, but it's also interpreted properly when you're getting die off reaction, let's say chills, panic and depression. You know, it's working. You know, you're having a positive effect. Uh, because it seemed that effect seems to be independent of the agent you choose. In other words, it's not the agent doing it. It's the death of microbes doing it. And you can actually, if we had access to a blood draw for serum LPS, you would see there's a big uptake in serum LPS. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. If people say things like, oh no, I can't eat nightshades like eggplant or tomatoes. I can't eat FODMAPs. I can't eat anything with fructose like fruit. I can't eat legumes. Oh no.